Welcome, 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 welcome to this week's episode of the Hall of Gains and Hypertrophy podcast. Um, this week, Stoff will not be joining us. Um, he has some other uh, obligations this weekend, um, some life changes and all that. He will be back for next weekend, um, but he asked me to kind of handle this weekend on my own. Um, not a problem with me. I'll chat with you guys for a little bit. Today will probably be a bit of a shorter episode, kind of covering a couple different topics here. I'm um, going from there. Uh, the recording for this episode is taking place at night. That's why my lighting is a bit different. I'm also trying out a new camera as well to see how that looks. So if you're watching, bear with me. Listening, obviously, this isn't going to affect you at all, but figured I'd mention it. With that being said, I figured uh, some, a couple things we could talk about today that um, if I was recording with Christoph, it would be more just me kind of just riffing than kind of having him input more. Um, so figured now would be a good time to talk about it. Uh, one of those things is the mental side effects of anabolics and, um, less about the actual mental side effects and, um, more about what are some tools you can utilize to kind of deal with them in a better way. Uh, I'm sure that most of our listeners do not touch them, but in the case that any of you do, uh, there are some tools that I've learned, um, tools that I've used in order to uh, make it easier to deal with how it affects me. And then also I figured we would touch base today on um, an additional topic of what to do if you've hit a plateau. Uh, Cause you know, recently uh, everything is starting to get back to normal for me, mainly because of getting back on testosterone, um, which is something else to touch on today. Um, the reason I want to touch on the mental side of things is I could feel the difference mentally and physically between not taking test and taking test again. Um, so with that being said, we'll just hop right into it. So as of Monday this week, um, so roughly week today, Sunday is roughly week. Um, I will be, uh, about, yeah, you know, six, seven days on uh test again, 300 milligrams, nothing crazy, additional, uh, amount of Kerogoline, uh, which is just 0.25 milligrams twice a week. So half a milligram a week, very low dose on that and as well as 12 and a half milligrams of aromasin every other day. So right off the bat, my caber and aromasin usage is from my own personal experience and, and issues that I've had. So the issues there stem from things that I've gotten checked, things that I've experienced on different foods, things that I've experienced on different cycles and, you know, trying to, trying to deal with all of that all at the same time. So uh, aromasin being an aromatase inhibitor Basically what that will do is uh, helps suppress estrogen. Um, we talked about it before. I've talked about it a million times, brought it up. Um, personally, I prefer aromasin over Arimidex. Arimidex is a bit harsher on your body, um, just like many other things are that I've taken. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. I'm just saying if I could do something that's equally or potentially more effective while also um, not doing as much damage to my body, then I will absolutely take that route. So aromasin is one of those. So aromasin compared to Rimidex, it all depends on, on what you need from what I've seen as far as the bodybuilding goes. I'm not by any means a doctor. This is not medical advice, nothing like that. With that being said, um, my own experience and from what I've read that guys have said is that uh, the what they found valuable with Rimidex is it's faster in the system uh, so if you need it on a, you know, quick note, you know, something like that, you need to just get it in your system. You can take it. Um, it's almost kind of like a quicker half-life. I'm not exactly sure what the half-life is. Um, actually, let me just see if there is a half-life on it. Um, that could play a role. Yeah. So half-life on Aromidex. So brand name Anastrozole, uh, it says 40 to 50 hours. Drugs.com says 30 to 60 hours. But then if you compare it to aromasin, um, the aromasin half-life is around 24 hours. So, which is actually surprising. I thought aromasin would be longer, I guess, um, than aromidex. But the reason I say that is because um, guys experience that aromidex is faster in their system than aromasin is. Um, essentially, the way your body kind of adapts to it is aromasin is pretty much instant, where aroma, uh, sorry, aromidex is instant where aromasin can take a week or two for it to really kick in, especially when you're in the lower dose like myself. 
uh, 12 and a half milligrams every other day. Typically what you see with aromasin is 25 milligrams every other day or, you know, more or less depending on uh, your body's estrogen responses while taking different anabolic steroids. Um, most anabolics out there are derivative of testosterone, at least that you'll see, um, you know, guys taking. So with that being said, aromasin for me, I prefer because it's not as harsh on the body and really you get the same results, if not better, because it's not harsh on the body, uh, suppresses my estrogen uh, to where I need it to be. Uh, and then from there, my body is able to respond better. Um, it's also for me, it's not so imperative that um, we pull it prior to a show at a specific date where something like testosterone, you want a quicker half-life, um, whether that's um, you're, you're taking something like uh, testosterone prop or acetate or something like that in comparison to it, inenthate, which is what I'm on now is testosterone inenthate. You want it out of your system faster for a show. So when you're, let's say like 10 days out, um, you know, 15 days out, whatever it may be, uh, you'll pull testosterone at that point. Or it's one thing that guys do is pulling testosterone early. Obviously, every single person's strategy is different. Every coach's strategy is different. So um, this is just what I've seen and what I've talked to other guys about. They'll pull it, let's say, 10 days out, you know, the uh, a week and a half before or so, and uh, it's out of their system by the time, you know, they step on stage. This is something that you want. So there's less variables going into the stage itself. You're not being affected by your testosterone levels or anything like that. You know, bunk gear, bad pins, anything like that. So pull it plenty of time and the shorter half-life ensures that it's out of your system in time. Aromasin, you don't really got to worry about stuff like that. It's not, um, you know, so imperative on your body that you take it out. If anything, you actually, I want to say I actually kept it in up until the day of the show, uh, just because with as you should build up, you also get water retention. So it's possible that you can run it a lot closer to the show or Remedex. It's faster in your system and faster out from what a lot of guys have experienced. Um, you also have to take, take it more frequently as well. Uh, every other day or every day is pretty typical for uh, Arimidex. Um, and also the the dosage, even though the dosage is just smaller, doesn't mean that it's not harsher. The dosage for it is is pretty strong. Um, it's like saying, uh, you know, uh, or like Cabergoline, for instance, 0.25 milligrams sounds like nothing, but that's plenty for me. You know, that's 0.5 milligrams is an actual regular dose of, of Cabergoline. So um, the extra milligrams of, you know, these, these oral supplements can vary from supplement to supplement, you know? So, um, same with like, you know, comparing it to others like, uh, testosterone, masteron, trend, uh, Anavar, or anything like that. Um, you know, D ball, T ball, they all have different dosages and what the actual milligrams do to your body that you're taking, you know, and then we also talk about IUs, you know, there's a lot of IUs in this space as well. You know, ACG I use is different than HMG I use. You know, we've been talking about that lately. HGH I use, you take, you know, let's say like four is a good like starting point for HGH from from what a lot of guys say that I know. Um, you know, compared to that to like, you know, a uh, dose of 500 I use of HCG, you know, whenever you're pinning it, you know, so like the, the milligrams doesn't really matter too, too much. Um, it's more about what the actual drug dues does to your body. With that being said, you know, I take aromasin because my estrogen builds up pretty easily. Um, I, my testosterone or really taking testosterone, my body produces a ton of estrogen and that's causing a lot of, you know, water retention issues and holding onto fat, stuff like that. So by taking aromasin, it, it keeps that all down, right? So uh, that's the reason I take aromasin. The reason I take cabergoline is my own reasons. So the reason for that uh, is not something that's pretty common. It's a prolactin buildup issue. So I build up prolactin very, very easily. Prolactin, um, as far as the way it affects the male body is it actually makes your body hold on to more fat and more water and all of that on purpose. The reason for prolactin, we always have it naturally in our bodies at a very low dose or low amount. I mean, not those low amount, but your body increases it when the person you are with, in this case, you know, let's say a female you're with and she's pregnant. This is really what it's for. So, you know, biologically speaking, you know, you're with your female, you get her pregnant while she's pregnant and getting closer to giving birth, your body naturally builds up its prolactin levels. The reason for that, you put on fat, you put on water and uh, you're able to store a lot more energy in your system. You hold on to food, your digestion slows down, you hold on to a lot more energy and you have a lot more energy in reserve and can use a lot more energy for that reason. So therefore you can get through the sleepless nights 
uh, with the new baby when the baby comes along. Because as we all know, babies don't want to sleep a lot of the time. So that's the reason for the prolactin buildup. As to why my body builds up prolactin, I have no idea. It builds up pretty strong. Uh, it's usually like the actual, uh, I want to say the actual normal amount is like two to eight deciliters or something like that. Um, this is just off the top of my head since the last time I measured it. I was like 25 or something. I was well over the the normal range. And when you say like, if you look at that, you're like, oh, you're triple it. When really that's the high end of the normal range. If it's, let's say it's eight and I was at 24, just for simple numbers, that's triple it. But then you turn it to six and that's quadruple, turn it to two, that's 12 times the amount, the normal amount, you know? So it just depends on how you look at it. So if you look at the exact middle of the range, let's say, you know, pretty much five or so, um, nanograms, then I'm, you know, five times quintuple the, the, the normal amount. That was just when we found out what the issue was. And the reason we found that out, we tested for, um, we did a blood panel, uh, blood hormone panel, um, to see what the issue was because I was on TRT a couple of years ago, uh, just, well, TRT in terms of bodybuilding is 150 milligrams, not really TRT. It's still super physiological amount. An actual TRT dose for, for testosterone typically is about hundred milligrams. Um, that's in date. That is usually if you go through T, uh, HRT clinic, it'll be, uh, a, uh, basically like a lotion and ointment that you rub on your skin. Um, at least for me, it's pinning it. So it's more readily available. It's more bioavailable for that reason. Um, but for me, you know, 150 milligrams is, is super physiological, but in comparison to, you know, running on cycle, it's, it's a low dose. So basically TRT for me, uh, with that being said, I was on TRT shouldn't really even be having any sort of estrogen issues. And we were taking AI at the same time. So not only is it really enough to like not really have any estrogen issues, maybe it's had high, but that's about it. I was taking aromas and to suppress it even further because I was having estrogen issues and we couldn't figure out the issues were because my side effect was really just gyno. It was just, it wasn't really building up. It was just painful. And, you know, I could see it. It's nothing crazy. I've seen really bad gyno. It's nothing like that. Um, but it is, you know, kind of just adds a little lump there. And I'm just like, man, I just want to get rid of this. And it's painful. I don't know why it's there. Um, and you don't realize, you know, how you don't have gyno or there's no painful issues there until you have it. And it's like, fuck man. Like, I don't realize how often, you know, anything is pressing against my chest, um, until you have it. So we're trying to figure that out, trying to figure it out. We ran a hormone, uh, you know, blood panel test and came back that my prolactin was high in comparison to everything else. So he said, all right, I want you to get some capergoline. I said, all right, sounds good. Order some keep rolling. First dose, like first week, basically, it was gone as if it was never there. My guy know that is. So that's the reason I took the keep rolling. Um, with all of this being said, aromas and the it's its own reasons that has nothing really to do with the mental side of things. The mental side of things is where the testosterone comes in. And basically, immediately what I noticed is irritability. That's for sure. Um, pretty much right away, I noticed that, uh, you know, everything was making me irritable. Uh, I was angrier, easier. Um, you know, I hated people asking me questions like, you know, I work in, in sales and sometimes it just, it got frustrating when, you know, uh, like somebody, the, the, a meeting was dragging on long or something like that. And, you know, I could deal with it. I can cope with it and I know how to suppress it and all that and deal with it. But I did notice that pretty much right away. 300 milligrams is also a decent dose. I mean, there's double TRT. I should be well over a couple thousand nanograms per deciliter total test, um, considering about 1300 is my TRT dose. So it should be, it should be pretty high up there. So it's a decent amount of test, not quite like typical steroid dose amount, you know? So, uh, with that being said, it was definitely noticeable right away. Um, you know, libido is a lot higher. Uh, I also noticed, you know, better protein synthesis. Uh, my digestion is a bit better now. So that's all played into it. But as far as dealing with the irritability side of things, the anger side of things, the, the primal increase in your body as a man, um, there's a few things you can do to cope with it. Obviously, training is one of them. Just putting out all your steam onto the weights is, is one way of doing it. Uh, that's a huge, you know... Uh, therapy session for me in a way, uh, I blow off all my steam in the gym. So that's one route finding, a, um, an escape route, uh, that, you know, is better for you mentally. Like for me, it's video games. 
Um, I also watch uh, a lot of racing, you know, so like I enjoy those things. So I watch all of that, you know, finding these different avenues to really put your frustrations out. Obviously right now is a popular game, Hell Divers. I've been playing a lot of that too. It gets frustrating, but it's, it's, it, I can almost vent into it because of what you're doing in the game. Uh, same with, you know, like racing games have to focus so hard. I kind of forget about my irritability and, and what's going on. So there's all that, that plays a role too. So there's different kinds of ways to, to kind of cope with it. Talking to people is another way of doing it. Um, you know, if you have like a stress ball, that's one way of getting around it. Um, and simply just breathing, just taking a second because your mind will play tricks on you, you know, and, uh, when you're taking a lot of testosterone, you're going to come up with scenarios in your head. There's going to be issues in your head that, you know, nobody else can see. So if you just take a second, just breathe, just know that you're not really actually angry. It's just the, your hormones fucking with you and whatever is making you irritable is really not actually making you irritable. It's just kind of your body's response to it. Um, then you can get you know, through it a bit easier. So that's one way of getting, getting around it. Uh, obviously other drugs have different side effects. And that's also what I want to touch on is that like a uh, DHT will have different side effects mentally than something like uh, a direct testosterone derivative. Uh, and then you also have your, your alpha nine nors as well. You know, your trend, your integral, um, and then, you know, your testosterone derivatives, D ball, T ball, testosterone itself. And then also, you know, some common DHTs, you got your Anvar, you got your Mastron, you got your Equipoise, you got Primo, which I want to say is a testosterone derivative, derivative directly. So um, DHT is dihydrotestosterone. Uh, so it's a testosterone derivative. Um, so, you know, all these play a different role. For me, you know, obviously the harshest one we were talking about in a previous episode is Trend. That one, how you deal with it mentally depends on the person. And it also depends on um, how your body responds to it. Uh, some guys get extremely angry all the time. Um, my issue in general with the combination of test master and trend was just, I was just angry all the time. Every yeah. single thing wanted me to make me blow the fuck up. Uh, granted, you know, you can deal with it and cope with it and all of that. Like I was saying, breathe, finding other avenues, blowing it out onto the, you know, into the gym. Um, do some push-ups, whatever it is, punching bag, you got to punch him back in your room or something, punch a pillow, scream into a pillow, whatever it is. Sometimes even just simply as that, you know, just grabbing a pillow and literally just fucking screaming into it, like actually gently calm me down. That's something I would need all the time. Uh, or just squeezing something like a table, you know, you squeeze like, like a countertop or something, just grab the edge, just squeeze. Um, that can let out some frustration. Um, the paranoia side of things. Just depends on however you want to cope with it. Uh, there's a lot of made up scenarios, relationship destroyer, you know, and you, you need to just take a second. It takes a lot of self-control sometimes when it comes to uh, trend in general to know that what's going on in your head is not real. Um, you know, there's times where um, I generally thought people wanted to fight me um, just because they're looking at me a certain way. The same goes for, uh, you know, relationship things that, you know, if you think your, your girlfriend, your wife or whatever is cheating on you be, while you're on trend, just calm down. I almost guarantee you she's not unless she is. And that's a different story, but you know, God forbid that happens. Um, especially on trend, but 99% of the time, I would say if you didn't have suspicions before, but you do on trend it's because of the trend. So just take a breather. Just know, okay, it's not me. It's the drugs. It's what I'm on. It's what I'm doing to myself that that's making this happen. Um, and then just dealing with other side effects with that too, like night sweats was my problem with trend. I got really, really bad night sweats pretty much every single night when I'd go to the bathroom because you know, you're, you're shedding water like crazy while you're in prep. So I had to go to the bathroom a couple times a night and every single night I'd actually have to grab a towel and dry off my head because my hair was all soaked. Um, my side of the bed was cold and wet. Um, it's just from night sweats. I was just sweating like a fucking pig every single night. No reason. I wasn't hot. I wasn't cold. Nothing like that. I wasn't cold sweats. It was just simply sweating in my sleep. So there that's, you know, dealing with that's another thing. So with that being said, I mean, you need to find an avenue. I think that prior to, you know, don't take anything, but if you did or going to find something that's going to um, calm you down, allow you to vent, allow you to put your frustrations out there um, and get rid of them prior to taking anything. That way you have some sort of avenue. 
Um, one thing that I would do a lot too, when I was in prep, especially when I don't have the energy for anything else. Like I didn't play any video games when I was in prep, um, because I just didn't have the energy for it. I just didn't have the focus. I just didn't have the energy. A lot of things that I would do is like, uh, listening to audiobooks. Anytime I was doing something with my hands, I'd listen to my, listen to an audiobook, allow me to focus on multiple things at once. That was one thing that I did a lot of reading, a lot of reading too. finding something that's mundane and can kind of set your, your mind apart too. For me at the time was, um, it's still a tool that I use, uh, haven't used it in a while, but it's runescape, which is a, you know, MMO RPG, if you know, um, for me, it wasn't about the quests. It wasn't about the story, which I can respect. It was about just the grinding. It was just the skill leveling and all of that. It kept my mind off everything else. Um, a lot of my job at the time, not now, but a lot of the job, my job at the time was less about meetings and more about just talking to people in general, um, over the phone, primarily through email sometimes too. Um, now it's all meetings and zoom and e emails and all that. But at the time, you know, making phone calls and playing RuneScape on another screen, just allowed my mind to just kind of get rid of everything and just kind of zone out for a bit. Um, so that's one way of getting around it. And then, you know, if you have like a big, a big thing too, that'll help a lot is just going outside, going for a walk in the sun. That's a big, that's a big, uh, big one there. Um, people really discredit how much your body really needs sun. And that's why, you know, we have, um, you know, seasonal depression and all of that. So I would say if you are any, it's a sunny, warm time of the year and you're able to just go out, you know, t-shirt shorts, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, and you're able to just go out and just take a walk in the sun, enjoy the heat, get a little sweat going or something while you're just walking around, listen to some music, listen to a YouTube video, listen to an audio book, whatever it is that plays a huge role in making you feel better. So, these are all some tools that I've learned tricks of the trade that has helped me cope with it a bit more. You know, there's times where I would get so angry. I genuinely would think I'd, br I'd break my desk. I'd hit it so hard. It would crack. Like it wouldn't actually crack, but I could hear like a splinter come off or something like that. Something that doesn't sound right when I do that. So I thought I'd break it. Um, it's not a good thing. It's not something to be proud about, but you know, there's times where I just get really, really angry at whatever's going on. And these are some ways to, you kind of deal with that. I also don't think you should uh, let it out when you're driving. Um, that's really dangerous. Don't let it out there. Um, or a motorcycle. Um, I've had, you know, motorcycle in the past when I was on cycle and that can be really dangerous too. Letting out your frustrations while riding is not a good thing. Um, break the law and potentially kill yourself. Um, so try not to do that. So don't put it into that. With that being said, we can get into the plateau side of things. So we've talked about it before, like what a plateau is. And basically, if you don't know, plateau is where you are making progress steadily over time. And all of a sudden for an extended period of time, whether that's three months, six months, a year, whatever it is, your body's not making any progress. You know, you're not going up, you're not going down, you plateaued, you flatlined. Everything's the same. Your strength is the same. Um, you know, you're, you're not making any differences. Your, your energy is the same. Everything just is the same. And you just end up kind of going through the motions of everything. And just, it becomes, it becomes a chore. You know, it's a schedule. Basically you're just there to do it. You know, you're just training to train. You're just eating to eat. Um, so how to get out of a plateau. There's a lot of tools that you can use. Recently I was in a plateau simply because I was on, I wasn't on anything. Um, my, testosterone and my LH were, were normal. My FSH and my free testosterone were low, which is just naturally where they're at. So, um, I was just, I was plateaued as fuck. Uh, you know, I stayed around 200 to 201 for the longest time, pretty high fat levels, just the way my body works. Right. It's just, I don't have the natural genetics for bodybuilding. It's just the reality. Um, but I respond really, really well to anabolics. Um, Obviously hair is an issue. That's why I always wear a hat in episodes is because my hair is just fucked. You can see some of it peeking out here. At least thankfully, thankfully, thank the Lord, my beard is fine. Um, but with that being said, when you plateau, I plateaued for a while there because we we're, you know, we're still trying to have a baby um, in this household, but um, I am back on, you know, gear as well while still trying to, you know, get pregnant, you know, there's, for, there's ways to, to keep your fertility up while on gear which 
you know, is there's been studies on it, a lot of anecdotal research, a lot of uh, doctors who run HRT clinics um, have mostly 99% success stories with it. So um, with that being said, we're still trying, but, you know, getting back on gear was just basically all I needed. I could already tell in about a week I've made some progress, which I'm pretty happy about. Um, my muscle memory is coming back. My muscle fullness is coming back. My pumps are a lot better now than they were. My recovery is through the roof. And it just also just made me a lot more, I, it gave me a lot more respect for anybody who's doing it naturally. Uh, you know, not on anything or never on anything. Uh, it gives me a lot more respect for that because it is fucking hard. My recovery is shit. I had a back day. Um, I mentioned this before, but I've hit a back day. I had a back day like I would while I'm on gear, whether that's during a, a bulking cycle or a cutting cycle, or whatever it is. Um, and my back was fucked for like three days. I couldn't move, uh, where on gear, I'm fine. You know, it just, it, it was just how it was. I just pushed way too hard and it didn't, didn't result well. So I have a lot more respect for those who are natural, who, you know, I didn't have any, I didn't have any fucking energy to train. I, you know, my pumps were terrible and I didn't realize it. It was just how they were. It was just, you know, sometimes I get a pump, sometimes most of the time I wouldn't. But sometimes if I focused a lot on just really, really high volume and just really long time, time under tension, then I'd get a good pump. But that's the only time. Um, and that's with pure workout that has pump stuff in it. You know, that's with salt and all that. Um, so, you know, I have a lot more respect for that now. With that being said, to plateau, a few things to try off the bat is changing up your food. You know, if you eat a lot of lean white meats, maybe try a red meat or something like that, that could play a role. Um, something like along those lines. Um, if you're eating a lot of red meats, try some lean meat, that could play a role as well. Uh, if you're eating a lot of slow digestion carbs, eat fast digestion carbs. You know, if you're eating a lot of oatmeal, a lot of uh, spaghetti, swap it out for maybe some, um, you know, rice, um, Let's see, what would be like a good morning quick digestion food? Ezekiel bread is a good one. It's just basically uh, seeds. It's like seed bread pretty much. Um, you know, that's a good one. Um, regular potatoes instead of like sweet potatoes that are faster digesting, do, you know, russet potatoes, which are a little bit faster. Maybe um, dehydrated potatoes. Obviously, I would say avoid those if you're trying to do fast digesting carbs anyways, but if you want to change up your sweet potatoes, for instance, go to russet potatoes or gold potatoes or something like that. You know, if you're eating a lot of, you know, cows and chickens or something like that, eat a lot more, like try seafood, you know, try some, some white fish, some, some, uh, salmon in there. Um, try all that, you know, spike your insulin levels, maybe do like a week of just eating double the carbs or something like that. Uh, do a week where uh, every evening you have, instead of a cup of rice, do two cups of rice or something like that. Um, or just do like a full weekend of, this is if you're plateaued, this is just not in general, this is if you're plateaued and you've been plateaued for a while, three, six months, you know, something like that. Cause that's the only time you'll know if you plateaued. You don't plateau for a month. You know, I was I was making progress for like 10 weeks. You know, it was just, it was tough. Like it, it all fell apart uh, getting off everything, which is, part of the addiction side of things. Um, it was all expected. Everything was expected. Everything was, you know, accounted for. It all made sense. So if in the case that, you know, you're in that position where every, you know, for a few months or six months or a year, you haven't made any progress, you know, uh, spend a week, spend a weekend, not eating it, um, anything healthy, you know, just have like a crazy weekend, you know, you just eat whatever you want. You drink some alcohol. If you know, you can do that, you know, you don't have any problems with that, then do that. Um, you know, to shock the body really like just, just go crazy with it. Uh, shock the body, really spike your insulin levels. And then your body should be in a better place for, for food digestion. At that point, your body will digest your food a lot better. That's a reason for cheat meals. It's a reason for free feeds is, uh, your body will then be able to digest food a lot easier going forward. Uh, it's how it works. You spike your digestion, your, your body's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We got to work extra hard to digest this. Uh, we, we got to kick it in overdrive guys. And then once it's digested, there's still an overdrive. So the food you were eating before is now being digested faster, and easier than, than it was before the refeed. So that's why you see often, um, you know, guys who are bulking, having cheap meals or refeeds once a week, twice a week, every other day, whatever it is that they're doing. Um, you know, refeed could even just be 
one meal increased carbs. You know, when I was in prep, a refeed was literally just like another ounce and a half of rice or something like that. Um, you know, your body is so refined. You're so fine tuning everything. I was talking to a guy in the gym and I could tell he's in prep. And I said, I said, man, you're looking, you're looking lean. You know, it, it, I could tell, are you prepping for a show or something? He goes, yeah, I'm 18 weeks out, which is fucking forever. I don't know how the fuck he's doing it that far out. He's probably, he's probably two weeks in a prep. I don't like five months out. That's insanity to me. Anyways, point is he's 18 weeks out. Dude is already pretty lean. Um, you know, if he had, if he was like three, four weeks out at this point, I'd be like, yeah, you're going to, you're going to do really well it's on the stage, you know, some fine tuning resulting, you know, fine tuning left over all that. But he, you know, was like, yeah, I, 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 you know, complimented how he was looking and he's like, thanks man. Thanks man. Coach, you said it in nine grams of carbs, man. I'm loving it. And I know exactly what that's like when you add in any bit of carbs, just, just a little bit, your body responds to it and you just have a lot more energy nine grams of carbs is like not even one piece of a Hershey's bar. Like that's, it's fucking, it's nothing in reality. But when you're eating, when you're so fine tuned, where you down to the gram, you got everything down to the gram. Um, nine grams of carbs is a fucking ton. Um, you know, if you're taking in for me, you know, if you're taking in like 50 grams of carbs to a hundred grams of carbs, you're increasing anywhere from 20 to 10 to 20% your carbs for the day. So it plays a huge role. Um, so adding in carbs could help you taking them out, doing a different diet. You know, if you're doing your own diet, trying something like keto, I don't recommend it for the long term, but maybe for shock in your body, do something like keto where you're under, you know, uh, 30 grams of net carbs, basically just pull out pretty much everything. Um, carb wise, just do, just increase your fats, taking more avocados, more, more butters, like almond butter, um, cashew butter, whatever it is that you're eating at the time. And then also just, um, you know, change the the meats to something more fatty, you know, add some more steaks in there, some more beef, bison, maybe salmon, stuff like that. Um, so if that's a bit more fatty, um, and then try to do a keto diet for two, three weeks, four weeks, something like that, you know, keto flu, you're really not in keto for about a week. So figure like maybe five weeks or something, you know, one week to get into keto and then four weeks of maintaining that can shock your body. You can get back to um, making some progress. As far as training goes, you could really reevaluate it too. If you're doing, you know, uh, six day splits, you know, six on one off, um, swap it to a uh, three on one off, three on one off. You know, you're, you're getting an extra rest day in there for all of your six days of training. You don't have to change your split. You know, you can do the exact same split as before. If you're doing like chest, back, arms, or if you're doing like chest, arms, back, rest del arms legs or something like that um and then another rest uh then that'll work you know something like that could shock your body um if you have a shorter split i know a lot of people out there do like weekday splits so you do like five on two off um change it up so it's like i don't know maybe two on you know monday tuesday thursday friday and then do like some cardio on sunday or something that can change up things too you get an extra rest day in there um your body can adapt to it well. Also changing from, you know, if you're doing really high intensity, changing to really high volume or vice versa can play a role too. Um, if you're plateaued, I think you do, you should probably increase your volume. Um, you know, instead of your int intensity, it's a lot easier on the body. It's a lot more healthy. Um, you could also change up what you're actually doing in the gym as well. If you're doing uh, a lot of free weight, um, try a lot more machinery, do something like that. If you're doing a mixture of everything, then maybe let's say you're doing two arm days a week and you're doing a mixture of everything. Do one arm day a week where it's, it's as much dumbbells as you possibly can. And then the next arm day, do as many cables as you can and go from there. Or you can do like a high intensity day and then a low intensity day, something like that, you know? So evaluate it that way where, you know, you can, you can adjust it from there. If you're doing a lot of, so like for like chess, if you're doing a lot of uh, pin loaded machines, try some plate loaded machines instead, or going to cables and doing more flies with cables rather than flies with a machine. You know, personally, I, I find cables flies are really, really helpful. I think you can get a really good pump with them, something like that. Or you can do like uh, a week of just, you know, going absolutely fucking crazy, you know, uh, take, take inspiration from, was it Marcus rule? I think, um, let me look it up just to be sure it's Marcus rule that did it. 
Let's see. Um, yeah, it was Marcus Rule. Do Marcus Rule shock, um, body shock uh, workout. Do something like that. He had one. Um, shock the world. That's a motivational thing. Yeah, so like he had one. He had a, um, it was a book. It's called Total Body Shock. Um, so he did like anywhere from, you know, three to three minimum to 10 minimum sets per movement or no, sorry, reps. So you can, you could, uh, you know, for this, he's doing like 10 to 12 sets on flat bench press, you know, whether it's barbell or dumbbell, doesn't matter. And he did three to four reps per set, you know, do something like that. It's really high intensity, but a ton of sets. You could do like 20 seconds of rest in between each set. You know, there's like no rest basically, or you can do the opposite. You could do like, um, three sets, uh, 10 to 15 reps. So you could do, um, if you're doing the same movements, you can do double the sets, but, um, lower the reps from, you know, 15 to 12 or something like that, but double the sets and go lower weight. Um, something like that you could do, um, just adjusting it so you could shock the body. And then also you could also change up your split. That's the other thing you can do too. Instead of doing, you know, where you add more rest days, if you really need the gym time or you just have nothing else to do besides at the gym, you know, I know a lot of guys who are deployed overseas, you know, they, they got nothing to do besides, you know, work for the, the eight hours or whatever it is that they're doing that day. And then just training for four hours. Cause you know, either that or they just sit on their bunk or whatever and just read. So they just go and train anyways. Uh, if you're just going to spend the time in the gym, let's say you're six days on one day off, which you need a rest day, regardless of what you're doing, you need a rest day at least a week. Um, you can go into the gym and do, you know, instead of like, um, you know, individual muscle groups, like chest, back, arms, shoulders, and legs, you could do like, um, you could do like a quad and ham and glute day. So like a quad day and then ham and glute day, and then do like biceps and chest and then triceps and back and then a delts and abs day or something. Right. So you could do all that, or you could do like, um, biceps, you can do like an, a total arm day. You can do more days per week. You can do like a chest back arm day, which is delts, triceps and biceps, and then legs and abs. You know, you could do those, those uh, three days and then you could do that twice a week, you know, something like that. Um, that'd be more difficult if you're natural, but you know, if you don't take it too crazy, you know, you do um, a couple movements per muscle group. Like if for chest you do, um, I don't know, maybe incline bench press and chest flies. And then for back you do like, lat pull downs, you know, T-bar rows and, uh, I don't know, pullovers or something, you know, that you know, just like kind of like decent compound movements that don't require a lot of weight that aren't too taxing on the body, um, but are able to hit each muscle group pretty well would be, you know, a good place to do, you know, something like this, um, you know, delts, tries and biceps, just do two movements each, do like front and side lateral raises. You can do like bicep curls with a dumbbell and then maybe pull-ups or something and then triceps do like dips and then some cable push downs, you know, that, that way you're just kind of hitting each move, each muscle group pretty well. You know, you get a couple, couple different movements, you know, do some high, really high reps um, that could change it too. Or you could say, you know what, I'm not going to change anything, but what I will change is um, let's say like the last movement, instead of doing the last movement, what you're doing for the day, do something where um, you just able to push every single ounce of strength back into the movement, you know, whether that's like, instead of doing a uh, tricep press or something for your last movement of the day, do like tricep rope push down, but do, you know, half the weight you normally do and just go for as many reps as possible and do that three times. You can just leave with your arms just burning, you know, something like that. You could also add an additional cardio as well. That could play a role. Um, do five minutes on the bike prior to a leg day. That could warm up your legs a bit better. And now you're starting to make some progress in your legs. These are all tools that you can use to, to get out of the plateau that you're in. Um, I don't recommend anything that I do, like taking tests. Uh, yeah, I got me out of my plateau, but that was also part of the plan. Regardless of what I was in for a plateau, if I was not in a plateau and I was making progress, then we'd still do it anyways. It doesn't, it wasn't really the solution. There was the problem just happened to be there. The solution was just what we're going to do anyways. So um, you know, I think that, you know, changing this up and then also a big one too, that, you know, I, I know not everybody has availability for, but if you do changing the gym, you go to, even if it's like similar equipment or the exact same, for instance, it doesn't matter. If you just change the atmosphere, your body can adapt, you know, you can, you can 
find some progress in there. You know, if it's, you know, you're going from one commercial to another or going from one dungeon to another, or you just go back and forth between gyms or something, then something like that, you know, could change your plateau. If you um, take a lot of pre-workout, um, then don't take it for a couple of weeks, you know, just, just completely come off pre-workout uh, just go a month without it, you know, and that could, that could change it for you, you know, do coffee instead, or just do um, a pump pre-workout instead of something high stem, you know, stuff like that can really affect your body. So if you take that approach, then, you know, that could result in getting out of your plateau. So what you do with this information is up to you. Um, you know, not everybody hits a plateau all the time. You know, you're going to hit, if you're natural, you're going to hit your genetic potential. Um, I don't think I ever reached my genetic potential. I was never natural long enough to ever know. But if you're, if you're doing it naturally, then you will eventually hit it. There is a point where your body is done. It's done putting on size. It's done cutting down fat, you know, whatever the case may be. And that's just where you maintain. Um, you will hit your genetic potential. Then you can just do kind of bulk cut cycles, you know, to, to try to push past it a bit. But really, at the end of the day, your body's not going to want to put on anything else. It's not going to take anything else off. You're probably just going to have to maintain. So um, if you're there, then you're in a different situation. But if you're not there and you're hitting a plateau, these are just some tools to, to, to help you get there. Um, you know, you could also do like a mock prep. If you're natural or you're not, just do a mock prep. You know, you can just do uh, like a six-week or not six, like a like a 12-week prep. You know, just slowly cut out food and add cardio and all that. Don't deplete yourself like crazy because you're not hitting a show or anything like that. Don't do anything like that. Um, just kind of treat it kind of like you're prepping for a show. And then after the show date, you just get back to normal. You have a, you know, a week of eating whatever you want. And then you go back to what you were doing prior to that prep, you know, example, you write. So these are all just tools you can utilize for something like that. What you do with it is up to you. Uh, these are just some suggestions, some things you can use. Um, if you end up using it, it works. That's great. You know, leave a comment, um, you know, leave a like on YouTube, subscribe. Um, we're always dishing out more information today with just myself talking and just kind of riffing off information from my head, uh, some Googling stuff here and there, but really just my own experience with things. You know, I've done a lot of trial and error with training. I've done a lot of trial and error with food and what I've result, you know, what results in the best for me. You know, I tried high volume for ch shoulders, for instance, for about six months and not really got much progress out of it went back to high intensity, eight to 12 reps on shoulders and just, just did a lot more progress in a month than I did in the previous six months. So, um, you know, I've tried a many, many different things, you know, cable focus workouts, machine focus, you know, free weight focus, all that, you know, um, and it all kind of changes. Um, most of my workouts, I would say I'm probably leaning either cable or machine. I don't have too, too much free workout and not free workout. Um, uh, free weights in my workouts. Personally, just my body doesn't respond to it the way that others do. Uh, it hurts my joints primarily. I don't go too heavy even. It just still doesn't agree. But um, for those that agree with free weights, um, that's great. It's even better for you because you could be easier for you to do a home gym or something like that. Um, it's harder for me because my body likes cables, especially cables. Um, but and machinery too, especially plate loaded. My body loves plate loaded machinery. So it's harder for me to have something at home. But with that being said, that should pretty much wrap it up for today. Um, hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys are still listening, make sure you leave a like, leave a comment, what your thoughts are, what's worked for you, um, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Hall of Gains and Hypertrophy Podcast. Um, we're trying to grow our YouTube channel as well as you know our other platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Um, so check that out. That's where we post our videos. We do post it on Spotify as well. If you're not watching on Spotify, you can watch our videos on Spotify. Uh, you can also watch it on YouTube. So, um, check all those out. Let us know what you think. With that being said, we appreciate your guys' time and I will see you guys next weekend with stuff. See you guys.